Hey, Smiles fans, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good weekend and uh, good life in general, really. So this week, wow, I was not expecting that to be launched this week. So this week, as you may know from the title, is all about the Raspberry Pi Pico. So you might have heard about this. You might not have heard about this. You might want to know a bit more about it. What's all the fuss about? Why is it uh, something that people are talking about? Why is the industry going a bit crazy about this right now? And how does it stack up to the uh, the SP32, which is a, an existing chip, which I've got one of just here. So this is a, a, an ESP32. So this is kind of the main competition for the, uh, for the Raspberry Pi Pico. So let's get on to this, shall we? Let me... Uh, if you hang around, we'll actually have a play with it. We'll uh, we'll run some code and we'll see how uh, how this thing works. Some micro Python. So uh, without further ado, let's get over to Keynote. So let me do that. So the most important thing about this thing, it costs less than four dollars. I paid something like three pounds fifty two, I think it was. Um, I bought a couple of them, maybe. <laughs> Sorry if you're trying to get hold of them. It's not all my fault. So what is all the fuss about with this? So. Raspberry Pi launched a new microcontroller this week called the Pico. So you might know Raspberry Pi from the uh, the popular single board computer. So we have one just here. So these uh, Raspberry Pis are really, really popular. Very, very low cost computer, runs Linux, a uh, full 32-bit computer. You can run HDMI monitors on it, 4K monitors on, excuse me, the new versions. But this is slightly different. Um, microcontrollers are more like the traditional Arduino. So I have a, an Arduino just here to show you by comparison. So this thing is getting a little bit long in the tooth, but it's very well supported. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of um, software libraries, documentation, tutorials, training, and so on. And all the sort of add-on features, all the add-on boards that you can get as well. So the Arduino is not going anywhere. Um, however, this Pico has sort of entered the market, which is a very different direction for the Raspberry Pi um, people. So it's a new venture for them. Um, and uh, it's got really wide industry support as well. So Adafruit have jumped on board with this. They're bringing out some Featherwing uh, boards of their own based on the, the RP2040, which is the chip that runs on the, the Raspberry Pi um, Pico. Uh, Pi Moroni, which is a, a UK company, they've uh, jumped on board as well. They, they're selling them like hotcakes in the UK. So lots of love to Pi Moroni. They're based in Sheffield, which is where my daughter goes to university. And uh, SparkFun um, have also jumped on this as well. So they're uh, also making um, boards available. So quite a few um, boards which are based on the RP2040 and also people just sort of selling them. So we'll get on to where you can get them from in a minute. And the company called Thony, um, which produces a software uh, Python editor, they've also in sync. This is one of the, as a project manager, I've just got to admire the beauty of how they've done this. It's all sort of come together perfectly on the launch day. Nothing beforehand, nobody knew about this. And then boom, day one, everything's just out there. Um, and you get them for ridiculously low amounts of money. And Thony, which is the, the editor, it just works. You plug it in, I've tried this already. It just works, so a thing of beauty. So when they were putting this together, they, they had three principal design goals for it. So first one is it has to be high performance. Um, so if you know anything about, um, I'm just trying to find the one there, uh, about Arduinos, they run about 16 megahertz. So they're not particularly fast, but for a microprocessor, maybe that's, or microcontroller, maybe that's okay. But if you want to do anything fancy with, say, audio, um, you need something which is an order of magnitude quicker. So one company called... Um, well, I don't know if it's the company's called this, but Teensy, they brought out the, um, if I can get that to uh, focus there, they brought out this little chip, which is, um, you can plug it into the Arduino IDE, you can program it in the, the usual kind of way, you can plug in a, a memory card, oops, in that in there, or just a USB and that in there, and you can program this. This runs about, is it 133, something like that, megahertz, so it's an order of magnitude, it's hundreds of times faster, uh, and ideal for doing audio processing. So this has been around for a while, but these are about 20 or $30 to buy. So this thing coming out with the same kind of performance, if not slightly faster, for $4, that's just insane. So let's put that back over there. The next one is flexible I.O. So we'll get into this in a minute. They've got something which is I've not seen before, which is programmable I.O. machines. So I.O. state machines. And it's essentially eight 
separate tiny little processors on the chip that you can program. So you can make them to be, I don't know, an SP, SPI interface or um, what else could you have them? But we'll, we'll get into all this shortly, but you can basically program these to be whatever you want. I don't know many other chips that can do that, certainly not for $4. Uh, I don't think you can do that on the ESP32. So this is this is quite new. And the main thing that they've, they've factored in as a principal design goal was low cost. So they always wanted this to be very, very low. So one of the first things that people will notice when they start getting into the specs is, is it doesn't have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So out the box, that's one of the reasons, that's how they keep the price low. And we can do a comparison shortly between the ESP32. So if you're looking to get um, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi on there, that's not on this particular model. There will be ones coming out. And again, we can get into that shortly. So um, that's one of the reasons they've kept the power usage low and also the, the cost low. So it's got a whole load of GPIOs. I think there's 40 pins in total. You probably can't quite see from this diagram, but it can. you can, you can do anything with these things. The programmable aspect of the IO means that you can actually assign pins in a way that on, on the Arduino, you know, you're kind of stuck with this pin being a, a pulse width modulation or being an SPI or being a, a UART. You can move these things around programmatically on this chip. So it's just insane. Uh, it has a little button on it as well. So you can select um, a little button just there. Get this to zoom in. I've got to get it right in the center of the camera. Oops. Let me just let me just hold it there like that. There we go. That's what I was trying to do. So that little white thing there, that's our little boot selector. You may or may not be able to see it says boot cell on there. Uh, and that uh, enables you to sort of select between programming mode, you know, where you want to flash the, the the program memory with something or whether you want to just use it as a, um, you just want it to run normally, whatever program is on there. It does have a little LED. So on our diagram, it's just this little area here. There's a tiny little LED and we'll use that um, shortly to run a little program. And um, it has a micro USB, so you can power it through that. You can transfer the programs to it, and it just pops up as a, as a, a drive, a bit like uh, the ESP32. So you can, or the micro bit, or the, um, uh, what's the other one called? The Circuit Playground. So I don't know if you've come across these Circuit Playgrounds before. These also are a similar kind of board, but again, nowhere near uh, the amount of power and flexibility that we have or cost point. So yes, we have um, an LED on, GP25, which is the, the the pin, general purpose pin 25. So I like the way that they've sort of got on board the uh, the silicon train. So when Apple launched their new um, um, CPU range, you know, the M1 chip, uh, which is what I'm running at the moment on this MacBook, uh, they call it Apple Silicon because it's their own their own design. They're not using somebody else's um, chip design. And it's similar with Raspberry Pi. They're calling this Raspberry Silicon. So here's the specs. So let's get into this. So it's dual core. It has two processors on there. This is insane. <laughs> you can get ESP32s with dual cores. I did check. I'm not sure how you program them. The, the development kit that comes with this um, makes it very easy to program for two cores. Um, it has 264 kilobytes of on-chip RAM. So that might sound very low if you're used to having like gigabytes of RAM. Uh, but remember, these things are microcontrollers. They're not designed to run, you know, graphical user interfaces and have, um, you know, TV shows running in 4K. These things are designed for kind of robotics or embedded applications. So they don't need very much RAM. And the actual programs that you write are very small as well. So don't need very much actual RAM. Um, but it does have two meg of um flash storage so it can support up to 16 meg of off chip flash storage as well so if you wanted to sort of bring that in uh, as an extra module you can do it has a direct memory access controller so this is useful for them at programmable state machines where they can essentially just grab things in and out of memory without interrupting the main cpu from running so this is this is pretty clever stuff um, it has an interpolator um, and integer divider peripherals so one of the things that they did as a design decision on this chip was to remove floating point for um, calculations. So when you're designing a processor, um, if you do um, 
floating point is one of those things that requires extra grunt and extra power because how many bits do you you know how many numbers in the floating point do you want to uh, what i mean by floating point if you're not following me is um if you have a whole number like one two three four if you have half of that you'll have like 0.5 so in computing terms that's called floating point because where does that decimal point um where is that in the number so when you're storing a number in memory you have to decide you know, I've got so much me so much memory to store this number in. What's the precision? And the more precision you have, the more memory it will take up and the more crunching of numbers that you'll have to do to get that precision. So a floating point is always one of those things that um, sort of comes as a, not a, as an afterthought, but it's it's um, a decision point when you're designing these chips. So what they've decided is, well, we won't include hardware floating point. We will do that in a very optimized library in software so this interpolator is to do with um, if you have two values and you want to get the middle value this thing will calculate that for you and equally if you divide two whole numbers and you get a, a fraction of a number this thing will have to figure out very quickly what that fraction is without it getting into floating point so it's got that kind of covered off it's got 30 pins for um, general um, input and output four of which can be used for analog inputs um, and you've got two UARTs, um, which is to do with like serial transmit and receive, two SPI controllers, two um, I squared C controllers. But again, we have we have this uh, state machine thing, so we can actually program as many of these as we like. We can have 16 pulse width modulation channels, so it's almost like um, one of these boards built in. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these boards, but we use them uh, for controlling like the quad SMARS robot, uh, and you can plug in all your your servos into there and it's got 16 of these inputs so this chip also has that as well straight out the box so that's quite a number i believe that the esp32 has a similar number of pulse width channels so it's kind of on a par with that it has um, a usb controller um, with host and device support which means when you plug it into a computer the computer sees it as a drive and the the file system is presented just like you would um, USB thumb drive. So that's really handy for when we're, we're, we're developing software, we use that functionality to, uh, to sort of flash code to it. Um, so what else have we got in there? We've got eight um, Raspberry Pi programmable um, state machines. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. From, from the computer scientist in me is like, this is really interesting. What is this about? Uh, and we have a USB mass storage boot mode with a UF2 um, support for drag and drop programming. So again, you can just drag some code onto the drive and when that file lands on the drive, it automatically flashes that if it recognizes the UF2 extension into program memory on the chip. Uh, very similar to how the, um, if you've used one of these uh, BBC micro bits, they work in exactly the same, well, same way and um, as well as the circuit playground so that that does the same kind of thing as well so you appears as a, a drive you just drag on the code and uh, it immediately uploads it and runs the code so yeah so this is a board lineup uh, i didn't include on here um the the arduino nano but i have got on just over here so Let's have a look at some of these boards um, just in the way of comparison. Um, so over here, we've got the sort of Raspberry Pi family. So there's the Raspberry Pi Zero. We have a Raspberry Pi 3 and 4. Uh, over here, we've got the Arduino family. So we've got the Mega, we've got the Arduino Uno and the Arduino Nano. And we have uh, over here the sort of ESP family. So this is a, an ESP32 camera. So this one has the camera module built on. Uh, oops, doesn't have a USB uh, port on this one, so you have to you have to flash things via the pins. This one is an ESP32, which is the main competitor, uh, existing competitor, I should say, to the uh, Raspberry Pi. You can see that there, it just says ESP32 on it. Um, so that has up between two and four meg of memory. And its predecessor, which is the uh, ESP8266, um, which is also the known as the Node MCU. There's the ESP8266. I've actually got one. In, in the sort of uncastellated form so let me just show you that there so that's that's the wi-fi module um and you can see that that's literally just splatted onto that board there but this one has no usb it's just got eight pins um but it has wi-fi so you can use these to bring wi-fi onto any board let's put that back there and that's the esp8266 uh, um, which again you can run micro python on these as well 
very, very flexible. I've used, in, used these in quite a few projects. Um, next to that, I've also got the, the Teensy, which we just looked at a minute ago, which is good for doing sort of audio. Um, very, very fast compared to the Arduino and that family. And then we've got the micro bits. So this is the, these two are the original micro bit. Uh, I had a little power module on this one so I could run, um, I could run it on a battery. That's why it's got these little standoffs on it. Uh, and then there's the slightly newer version, which has um, a built on, built in speaker and microphone. Uh, again, this runs uh, MicroPython. This has a uh, Bluetooth, I believe this time. Uh, whereas the original one, I'm not sure, does that have Bluetooth on it? I think it may do. It has a radio function as well. And then we've got some miscellaneous ones here. So this is uh, an ST-1, which is kind of like an Arduino chip, um, but it's very, um, it's not quite as capable as the um, uh, ESP type family, but it's a very small form factor. I've not actually played with that yet. It's got the little programmable button there. We talked about the ESP8266, and then there's a new one that I ordered the other week, which is called a Teenduino. No, Cduino. Cduino. I'm not actually sure what this thing does differently, but it's got a USB-C connector on it, which is uh, interesting. So we'll have a play with that one at some point. And then over here, we've got the um, Circuit Playground. So this is from Adafruit. So they, they produce this development board. And this is the Blue Fruit version, which has got Bluetooth on it. Um, and this thing has things uh, dedicated. I'll probably show you on this one a bit easier. This one has dedicated um, chips on there. So you can see there's like a little, if I can just hold it there and point to it. There's a little temperature gauge there. There is um, a little uh, I think it's that a microphone there. We have over here a little speaker. You can see a music symbol. We can see the Bluetooth symbol there. There is a little light sensor, which is what the eyeball thing is for. And what else does it have? It's got a whole load of um, extra sensors on there. So the idea with these, and it's also got um, LEDs, programmable sort of neo pixels, I think they call them, around the edge of the board. So the idea of this is you can crocodile clip to this. Um, you can sort of experiment with it. You've got all these different sensors already. So um, it's kind of designed for that that usage where you're experimenting rather than embedding it. Um, have thought about putting one of these in the SMARS as well, actually, just to see how that would uh, how would work out. So uh, just having a quick look on the uh, the chat there. So um, Tom was saying it's pretty tiny. It is ridiculously tiny, this thing. So let's just compare it to um, like an, an Arduino. You can see there it is. Let's get this to, to zoom in. It's a lot smaller and thin wise, it's like very, very thin. Uh, this one hasn't got any any headers on it. So I've, I've soldered on uh, one of the ones I've got on uh, here. Uh, this one has got some header pins on it that I've soldered on. I shall tell you a bit more about that in a minute. I had a bit of a moment where I thought, have I just blown this thing up? So let me just put that back there. So what else are people saying? So Max is saying hi. Hi Max, how are you doing? Hope you're having a good evening. Uh, Aina, how are you doing? Welcome to the stream. Uh, Aina is one of my colleagues on the live streaming pros group. Uh, Bennett, how are you doing? You've got two Kevs, Damien. How lucky are you? <laughs> We've got Rob. Hey Rob, another live streamer pro. And uh, Bennett, good to know about the speed. Yes, we'll get on to that um, in a minute. I've got uh, some comparison stuff too. So we've had a look at all these different boards, um, just as kind of, this is the family of, you know, other than the Raspberry Pis themselves, which are kind of a different class, really. Um, you know, these are all kind of similar. They do the similar kind of thing. Hey, Dominic, how are you doing? And uh, this is where we have the, uh, I've got three of them, the Raspberry Pi Pico. So you can see there, it's very, very small board. Um, you can see it in comparison to this, you know, the size of these other boards. Compare it next to like um, ESP32. It's kind of skinnier than that. If I just lay it on top there, you can see it kind of. It's quite a bit skinnier than that, and um, yeah, it hasn't got that great big Wi-Fi chip on it. It's just got its own little core there. And I've got one plugged in, so we can have a play with that momentarily. So let me just unplug this. Hopefully that won't interrupt anything. No. Nope. And I can plug this in. Hopefully nothing's going to go wrong there. Nope, that's good. Right, so we can uh, we can have a look at some code. Right, so let's go back to uh, our keynote. 
and so that was the um, the boards. I've just na named them there and put them on the slide so you can see uh, which you know which ones we've got there. So how does it compare then? Let's have a do a bit of a comparison. So I thought that the ESP32 is a good comparison because a lot of people want to know, you know, is it an ESP32 killer or is it, um, you know, how does it stack up? So it's got faster input output than the ESP32 due to these programmable IOs. So the fact that we can actually code and in assembly language, we can create our own state machine. We can create very, very, very fast uh, input output. Um, you can't match this on the ESP32. They just don't have that capability, is my understanding. The Pico uses about half the power of the ESP32, uh, and that's due to the fact that the ESP32 has the uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So that's a great big draw. You can probably switch them off on chip, um, but I, I believe even with those off, it's still quite a lot more power. So we can see there the power usage is around for the Pico. It's about 89 milliamps, and it's about 260 milliamps for the ESP32. Um, now, I wasn't quite sure about this. I read the ESP32 has 48 pins. Now, I've just counted these. There's 30 pins on this chip, so I think that's actually incorrect. So on that one, the Pico actually wins. It has slightly more I.O. pins. Uh, flash memory, the ESP definitely has a, a bit of a uh, an advanced uh, advancement there. It has twice the amount of RAM. Um, again, this is to do with the price point. So you can see there um, the, the, the ESP32, if I'm buying that from Amazon, it's about £7.49. If I'm buying the uh, Pico, it's about £3.52. So the ESP is about twice the, the, the amount of the Pico. But it's got twice the amount of um, SRAM, which is the kind of, you know, usable memory. Um, the flash storage is twice as much, and it has the, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. But it doesn't have the programmable I.O. And for me, I think that will be one of the things that makes... Um, gives the Pico a bit of an edge. So they both run MicroPython, which is amazing, and we will get onto MicroPython. We are going to do a lot with MicroPython this year. Um, I was delving into this and playing with this last year, um, and it was, it's quite bleeding edge at the moment. It's quite cutting edge. The Pico has this out of the box, so that's a real big win for MicroPython. And Adafruit, interestingly, went their own way with this, so we will get on to this. They've, they've developed their own um, version of MicroPython. So what is all this programmable input-output machine stuff all about? We'll get into this briefly. Uh, I just wanted to show you what this looks like. So we've essentially got two blocks, uh, one for each core of, the, um, of programmable I.O. And then each of them has four state machines, and each state machine has two FIFO queues, so first in, first out. So if you think about a regular queue, you're, you're queuing at the, um, I don't know, the post office, that's a very British thing to, to sort of suggest as a, an analogy. You're queuing at the um, supermarket checkout. There's a big queue of people, one after the other. The person at the front of the queue gets served first, so it's exactly the same with a FIFO queue. Whatever is the first piece of uh, instruction or the first data packet, that's the thing that gets looked at first. And we have two of them. We have one for receiving data and one for transmitting data, so they're essentially buffers, um, but it means we can push and pull things onto those stacks, those queues. Um, I have to be careful mixing my stacks and queues there. Stacks are slightly different. <laughs> So anyway, so and each of the state machines has an X and Y scratch register, so it has a 32-bit register, that's two of them, where it can just temporarily store values of things so you can do operations on them. So what this means is that we can re we can set and read values of pins, we can set and read values of memory. It's asynchronous from the main CPU, which means that the main CPU can carry on running a program and these things can run individually. All eight of them can be doing their own thing, which just blows my mind. Um, and we can we can actually develop programs for them. There's only nine instructions, so it won't take long before someone's written Pac-Man for one of these. I can guarantee it. Uh, maybe that's a summer project for me. <laughs> so you can create extra SPI, I2C, and UART um, ports. If you don't know what they, those are, don't worry about it. This might be a bit too in-depth for some people. Um, and you can you can create ports that don't currently exist um, as well. So that's where when the chip manufacturers are making these and they say, you know, how many PWM ports do we need? How many SPI ports do we need? You can create your own port using this uh, state machine. So very, very clever. We could create, as it says there, bespoke WS2812B driver for LED dimming. I don't even know what that is. So 
where can you get them from? So what I thought was rather than putting it everywhere in the world, I would just pick three countries almost at random. So UK, you can get them from um, SB Components, Pie Hut, Pie Moroni, yay, Pie Moroni, and um, OK Dough, is it? Never heard of them before. Uh, interestingly, they are also in the US. So Sparkfun, Adafruit, Pie Shop, to name a few there, kind of kit. And then in Germany, I kind of just randomly pick some places. You can see, what's that, Reichelt, funk24.net, W Electron, Pi 3G, and Berry Base. That's quite a nice name. They're likely to be sold out. I'm not being funny. Uh, I did check on the UK. They still had on Pimeroni, you could still buy individual boards, uh, one per customer. So worth trying there if you still haven't got one yet in the UK. Not sure if you can order one of those from overseas. Um, maybe you can. So what can you do with a Pico? So obviously control robots. So what I'm thinking is I'm going to stick one in this guy. So I built this. It's been sat on my shelf for a number of months and it's an open cap. I've actually got a second open cap hot off the uh, 3D printer, which I've not quite assembled yet. Um, I think it's a slightly updated version. So um, that's one of its legs. You can see it's got like a little paw thing on it. If I can sort of get that into focus, um, whereas the other version doesn't. So uh, this one hasn't actually got a brain. It's just got a whole load of servos, which are uh, just dangling off here. I've not wired them into anything. I've not brought it to life. Um, you can put the um, range finder sensor in there so that it's got like, um, not eyes, but it can detect distances. And I was thinking, you know, maybe include a little, um, that's a little screen. Um, I'm just going to have to get better at doing this. That's a little screen. That's a little Adafruit screen. Again, just pardon my awful soldering that's on there, but um, that's uh, an eye to see screen. I'm not sure of the resolution on there, but um, it's just like a black and white LCD screen. Maybe thinking about putting that on there for a bit of status um, so you can see what the robot is doing. And yes, we would also have uh, one of these as well which is the uh, PCA9685 board for controlling servos. So <clears throat> we'd plug all those, those loose cables into there, and then we just get a couple of cables out the back of there, which is usually clock and data, and we can plug that into our Pico. So that's what I'm thinking there. We can have a Pico controlled uh, robot. We can also put them in um, uh, auto DIY or our SMARS robot as well. So. Lots of possibilities there. That's what I'm thinking. So let's get back to um, the screen there. So how are we going to do this? So we can use the, the Arduino IDE. Pico is supported today out the box um, using the, the Arduino IDE and all the language that you're familiar with. However, I think you're missing a trick if you don't switch to MicroPython at this point. So Python, MicroPython support in the Pico is huge. They've really gone to town on this. There's a very beautifully lit written um, software development kit. These things are not normally very well written. This one is very well eloquently written and very, um, very easy in, in the style of Raspberry Pi. If you've not visited their website, um, check it out. They've got some really good documentation, some project ideas and explanations of how the code works. And the thing I like about it is it's understandable by, you know, children as well as adults because of the way they've written it. So this is great for learning. And I think this is one of the differences between say the ESP32 ecosystem and the, um, the Pico ecosystem. They've really put a lot behind this. It's not just the board, it's the whole website. It's um, all the other people getting on board with it. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, so yes, that, that is a screenshot there of Thony, which is the Python ID and the little button, the little dialog it's got there. It says, what, where do you want to save this program to? To the computer or to the MicroPython device? Um, and it supports quite a few MicroPython devices. It supports the um, Circuit Playground, the Microbit and now the Pico. So we'll be having a look at that. Oops, in a minute. So sorry, that's just zoomed past a couple of things there. So, so what is MicroPython? It's not 
a small snake. <laughs> so from their website, they say, MicroPython is a lean and efficient implementation of Python, Python 3 programming language that includes a small subset of the Python standard library and is optimized to run on microcontrollers and is con and in constrained environments. So whereas we would normally run Python on PCs, Macs, Linux, um, and maybe like Raspberry Pi type chips, um, Python is designed, MicroPython is designed to run on embedded chips. So it's very, very small footprint. Uh, hasn't got all the full functionality of Python, but it has a lot in there. So the reason we want to use Python is it's a lot easier to write programs and understand them in Python. And that's one of the reasons why Python is now one of the world's, if not the world's most popular programming language. So it's overtaken Java, it's overtaken JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is mainly for um, browsers, but you can use it to develop other things as well. It's got um, Node.js is a sort of flavor of that. C Sharp um, is under under that. Then we have um, way down the list. Um, I don't even know if we have uh, C++ on there, actually. Oh, yes, yeah, C++ is underneath um, PHP. PHP is a bit of a dying language, and sad to say for those PHP people. Um, and then C, C++, which is our Arduino type language. So you can see there just the order of magnitude, how much more people and how much more popular Python is. That's a bit of a tongue twister, how much more popular Python is. Um, and that's why they've got onto this bandwagon and thought, let's let's use MicroPython on this, on this chip. So if we look here, we've got Python that was developed first. MicroPython is based on Python as a subset and Adafruit have sort of got their own dialect of that. They've made some things slightly easier to, to use and understand and they call it CircuitPython. So it is just um, a cut of MicroPython. This thing, um, like any language, is being developed on a sort of daily, weekly basis. So there's always new features available. So if you're enjoying this, um, this show so far, um, please make sure you leave a comment um, somewhere. I can see there's quite a few people commenting on the show already, but uh, please comment on it. Please subscribe and uh, hit the little bell icon as well. That helps uh, you get notified when I go live with things. So we have these regular shows every Sunday and I usually have some kind of midweek uh, pre-recorded video as well. So let's have a quick check of the uh, the messages there. So we had uh, Dominic saying hi, we've got Ovi sort of saying that's cool. And you're saying Canada. Yes, Canada, that, that strange country north of America. Some strange people live there, don't they, Joe? <laughs> or did. Um, the other call to actions as well. Um, so you may or may not know that we do have a video every Sunday, 7 p.m. GMT. And here's all the other time zones as well. So you can see that on the left hand column, we've got the Americas and Canada. In the middle, we've got the uh, European, India, Pakistan, some Russia time zones, not all of them. And we also have on the right hand side there, China and um, Australia. So you'll know where you live. You'll know roughly what kind of time this goes live at. But um, yeah, we're pretty consistent. We, I'm pretty consistent going live at 7 p.m. every Sunday. And if you've not checked out the website, I would also recommend that you have a quick look at smilesfan.com. Um, it's mainly designed around these little guys. Um, how to develop them and the, the quad version as well, the, the walking robot. Uh, but I will be putting some extra things on there about the Otto and also the Open Cat um, as I develop these out too. So it's not just about Smart robots, um, even though the domain name would suggest that. But you have a check out on there. I'm always putting new stuff on there and um, I explain how the code works and sort of talk you through that. So there's, you know, good, good educational materials on there too. OK, so let's get back to our keynote and um, let me see what else we have. So demo time. Let's, shall we have a, a bit of a play with this thing? So let me bring up, um, let me see the best way to do this. So I'm going to, let me just get my screen sorted here. So I need to open Thony up and if I go like that there, we can see I've got a very sh straightforward program loaded and what I'm going to do um, I'm just going to make sure everything is good. So if I stop that and start that, yes, that's going to work. Right. So I can also do a sort of three up thing. So we can see on there, um, the, there's the chip and there's a little flashing LED. And we can see that there's a cable there that's going into my computer. And we can see the code just below here as well. Um, 
that we're running, but I'll, I'll just come to full screen just to explain this for a minute. So, so what we have here is um, from machine import pin. So machine is how we access all the features of the Pico through Python. So we normally use from uh, an import to bring in new libraries. And this is what we do here. We're going to bring in the pin um, class uh, and that represents a pin on the device. So, you know, one of the little pins just on the uh, on the actual device. So any of these 40 pins are on here. So we're also going to import time because we want to do um, a delay. We want to make it sleep for an amount of time. And the first thing we do there is we say LED equals pin 25 and it's an output. So similar to how we do that on the Arduino where we do the, um, the pin mode where we sort of set the digital pin mode to output. That's exactly what's happening here in Python. And then we've got a little loop here that says while true. So basically just repeat this forever. Um, set the LED value, which we've defined there, which is on pin 25 to one. So make it go on, sleep for a second and then make the value go zero and then sleep. So what's happening there, if we go back to our three up view, is exactly that. It's going on for a second, it's going off, it's going on. So what I will do, I'll just bring down this here and we're actually running this code live on the chip. So if I change this value here, so instead of it sleeping for a second, I'm gonna make it sleep for half a second. Let's do 0 0.5. If I now just save that, it's immediately going to save that code um, onto the device. If I just click run script, uh, let's see now. That's now flashing much quicker. So you can see that it's going on and off um, twice a second. Uh, we can illustrate that a bit further. If we do 2.5 instead of 5, we'll see this run even quicker again. So I just hit uh, play and we can see there now it's flashing quite fast now, quite rapidly. And all I'm doing here is just hitting the uh, the run script button on um, on Thony. So on here, I'm just literally hitting this run script. And down here, this shell thing, this is um, this is the actual MicroPython shell. So we can, we can, oops, sorry, let me just get rid of that. We can um, press control C, I believe. And then we're now in, we're, at, we're now talking directly to this board. So um, let me go back to, this view here. We're talking now directly to the board. You can see it's no longer flashing the LED. Um, the LED is actually solid and we're running this live. So if we come down to our code, we can do things like DIR. We can do DIR and um, let's try pin to see what pin can do. And we can see there we've got open, we've got um, in, we've got IRQ falling, IRQ rising, pull down, pull up, high, low and toggle. So toggle's interesting. So maybe instead of having to do um, um, values one and zero, we could just say toggle the value, whatever the value is currently, just do the opposite. And IRQ rising and falling is an interesting one if, you, if you've ever used inter, interrupt um, routines. So inter, IRQ is interrupt request channel. And this is to do with um, when you want to have a program that's running and at some point, but you don't know when, an event is going to happen and you want to stop the execution of your program, branch off immediately and start running some other code, handle whatever that thing was, and then jump right back to where you were and carry on. And that's what interrupts do. And computers use them all the time for handling things like, you know, you put in a USB memory stick or, um, you know, you, you press play on um, your MP3 player, your iTunes or whatever. All those things can generate interrupts, which can sort of stop the current program running. And um, and it does it so fast that you won't even know that this is happening. And rising and falling is, has the interrupt just happened? Or has the interrupt sort of, um, is, is it sort of handing back to the program? So depending on what sort of event, you know, where in that um, cycle you want these things to happen. And that's the sort of rising edge or falling edge of that, um, that thing happening. So we can use that and that's all in the pin library. We can do DIR machine to see all the different things that the machine can do. So we've got um, analog to digital. We have uh, I squared C, pulse width modulation, power on reset, we've got pin, we've got SPI, soft I to C, soft SPI, timer, UART, uh, WDT, WT reset, bootloader, frequency, memory 16, memory 32, memory eight, reset and reset cause. So 
whole lots of different things for us to look in there. Now that might seem a bit overwhelming at first when you think, oh, I don't know anything about this chip, what it can do. And this is where Raspberry Pi have your back. So if we just head back over for a second to, um, let me load up my browser, uh, which is just here. So they've got a website. Uh, if you go to raspberrypi.org and you just go to the, uh, the Pico, you'll find that they've got your back covered. So they have all these, um, data sheets, but they also have these, um, uh, if I can find it here, um, downloadable uh, PDFs for free, or you can buy them as a, as a physical book. They were also giving away the, the Pico for free on the front of the Hackspace magazine because it's only £3.50. They did that with the Raspberry Pi, and that's why they're sort of saying, you know, we've done it again, we've given this thing away. And uh, yeah, they talk about that there. They talk about the uh, Raspberry Silicon. Um, what else do they do? can see there interestingly that that picture they have there this is how mine came so i've got the exact same thing there that's off the spool so whatever machine they've used to develop these that's how mine came just sat in that little piece of plastic tray there with the, uh, the sort of silly, uh, the plastic foil over the top so yes they've got all these pdfs that you can uh, very easily download and understand you know how to do various different things so the doc documentation which we've got there we've got um, getting started with raspberry pi pico so if i click on that uh, it opens up this, um, you can either download it as a, as a physical, sorry, you can either buy the book for £10 or you can download it as a, as a um, PDF. So I um, can't remember how you do that on here. And th this is one of their things. They want to be able to give away these things for people who uh, can't afford them, but also people who can afford them can have a, you know, beautifully printed book as well. So I've ordered the, um, the Python, MicroPython on Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, that hasn't arrived yet, so that should arrive next week. So I'll be able to show you that. And the other thing I wanted to show you is, so look at this. This is a, a an unexpected um, thing. So Arduino, so on their Arduino blog, they've said, welcome Raspberry Pi to the world of microcontrollers. And um, they talk about all the um, um, background to this. They talk about... Um, MEM sensors for microphones, and they talk about they're going to do an Arduino version um, based on this new Raspberry Pi 2040 chip with the Arduino ecosystem, so the IDE, the, the libraries, and so on. And they're going to put in things like Wi Fi and Bluetooth as well. So this is really interesting. It's not what I would have expected yet. You can see there they talk about adding in the Nina Wi Fi, I'm just in the way there, uh, Wi Fi Bluetooth module. So this is what, not what I expected at all. I would have thought, you know, this is one of their competitors, but no, 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 they have jumped on the same bandwagon. This is the beauty of Raspberry Pi. They've, they've really thought this thing through. They've thought, who are our competitors? Who can we get on board? And uh, they've joined up with uh, Arduino themselves. So this isn't a, a competitor. This is, they're going to launch their own product based on the same chip. And uh, yeah, there's the, the chip itself. Uh, I went on Adafruit. They've sold out, but it's again, just $4. Um, you can see a bit closer up there. They've got some very nice product shots of that as well. It is tiny. Um, it's a bit easier for you to actually see some of the, um, the pinouts there. So you can see all the different uh, GP pins, general purpose pins. Uh, we've got some debug ones down there as well. Um, and we've got some voltage. So this thing can do the usual kind of 3.3 volts, 5 volts. Uh, I think it's quite tolerant of voltages up to about 7 volts, I believe. And it it can also run very very low power. So they've there's an awful lot in the in the tech manuals that I was reading about how to put this thing into a very very low power mode, a bit like the ESP32. Um, but but it's ridiculous low power. We're talking like is it 0.01 milliamp something? Just hardly any power at all, like static kind of power. So. That's pretty genius uh, that they've done that. So just wanted to show you there, the ecosystem, you know, the, the, the documentation that they put out there is superb, it really, really is good. So just wanted to share that with you. Um, let me go back to Keynote. Um, so we've done a bit of a demo, we've talked about that. Uh, why is my picture disappeared from there? So next week, um, I'm gonna be looking at how we can use this in our Smiles robots and also my open cat. Um, you can see he's got it there between his paws. So I'm going to wire one of these things up 
So I had a bit of a disaster. <laughs> I've bought three of these, uh, plugged two of them in, just checked that they work. And then I went and got some header pins and started soldering some header pins onto this. Now, I'm not the world's greatest solderer, I will admit, but I thought I was doing a really good job of this. So I got some flux, I carefully put the flux along the uh, the little solder pads there, give them a bit of a scrub first so that they would uh, they were oxidized. I've got my header pin, I've put some, and by header pins, uh, a bit like these ones, but the, uh, the, the sort of, other variety so these are these are ones for receiving pins these are sort of is that a female and the ones i've used the male ones so um so yeah you know i was i was i carefully sort of put some flux on that as well put them together got some blue tack held it together got my soldier iron made sure that it was you know it was only on there for a couple of seconds and they were perfectly um adhered soldered pads went along did both of them sprayed on some um flux cleaning spray which i believe is just isopropyl alcohol but as a, as a spray um and then wiped everything off plugged it in and it didn't work and i thought have i just blown up this chip it's only three pounds but you know these things are rare so i you know i really wouldn't like to have one that doesn't work and i thought maybe it's just that the um the alcohol the isopropyl alcohol has like gone under some of the contacts and it's shorting them together or something so i thought i'll maybe just leave it a little while and let that dry and see if it works and it works so the one we've just been trying out there um is the one that had th that problem <laughs> so thank goodness um thank goodness it actually worked so we've just got some more messages come through there so um george is saying um so Captain McGluff is saying hi Kevin in chat and George is saying really looking forward to the Arduino board yeah me too I'm very interested to see what other companies do with this um, and uh, yeah you, lucky that you found some Picos still around so yeah there are one or two available um, or you can buy them individually I'm not sure how smart they are at um, so if you bought one and then you went back to the shop and then put another order in for another one I think you can do that I think their ordering is that they don't want somebody just ordering like 500 of these buying them and um, putting them on eBay and then just trying to you know gouge the market I think that's what they're trying to prevent happening so they probably don't mind you buying one or two for yourself personally they just don't want people buying tens hundreds of these things um, and then just making the, the no availability there and I uh, got a message there. Unfortunately, it doesn't always bring up the name of the person um, when I'm using Restream, which is a bit frustrating. So it says, hi, Kevin, um, could barely catch you live, but um, sure, we'll get to like after I watch um, watch it through. I never cheat looking forward already. Thanks. So that's good. So um, yes, this is uh, the second week I've been doing um, using Restream. So I'm on Facebook and Twitch and Twitter and also YouTube. So all the places. And I can see there from the number of people we've got watching, we've got about 13 people watching currently. So um, that's quite higher than we have normally because I try and bring you all over to YouTube and people prefer to stay in Facebook if that's where they watch. Um, I haven't marketed this to, to Twitch. I've really not set up the channel for that. Uh, maybe I need to look into that. But it's a whole different sort of ecosystem than YouTube and Facebook. But the software that I'm using will just bring in the comments so I can see um, if anybody messages me about something. So is that everything I had on my slide deck? I'm sure I had something else on there. No, I guess not. So um, so I've had a quick look through if there was anything else we were going to talk about on there. So I'm really excited about these chips. Um, I can't wait to start, you know, getting to using MicroPython for real and getting this, you know, actually controlling a robot so we can see, you know, is this thing capable? Does it work? Does it work well? And, you know, what is it like to develop in MicroPython? So I've already developed some Python libraries already. So the, the Smiles Quad uses Python and um, I can bring those libraries into um, the MicroPython environment. Uh, you just add the files to the same folder directory and just import them as you would in a normal Python file and that works fine. The only thing I haven't tried yet um, is bring in the PCA9685 driver. Adafruit have written this already for MicroPython, so we can literally just drag that in and just use it. So that's the beauty of uh, MicroPython. And we can talk a bit more about MicroPython as well, because um, there is a lot to know about it. Um, it is nuanced, I would say, but when you get into it, it's very, very easy. So very rapid to develop things. The code looks like basic. If you remember from back in the day when we had uh, basic, uh, and one of the things I was going to bring into my uh, my room here, maybe put on the wall up there, is I've got um, 
thanks to my very kind auntie, I've got a BBC Master, a BBC B, I think it is, an original um, microcomputer from the 80s. And uh, I've also got a ZX Spectrum as well. So I was going to put those on the wall behind. Uh, and that's where I learned basic. That's where I learned programming many, many years ago, <laughs> like 30 odd nearly 40 years ago um yeah so 1982 when the zx spectrum came out we got one of them uh, got one of those as a family it was my brother's computer uh, but when he wasn't using it i would sort of go on there all of its rubber key goodness but uh yeah it, it you know started that kind of sparking me about coding and uh, i've never felt like i was up to par with my brother he's always a much better programmer than i am but um yeah, it's Python has that same kind of feel to it as basic. It's very easy to understand. Uh, and Tom was saying, hmm, seems I need to get back to Python. Yeah, I was quite scared for quite a while um, off using it. It looked just like another thing to learn. But when I got into it, I was like, why have I not been using this before? It's really easy to write programs in it. Um, you don't have to know all complicated syntax. They've taken a lot of that you know, clutter away. So for example, if you're writing an Arduino program, you've got to remember your curly braces and they've got to pair up. You've got to remember to have the uh, the semicolon at the end, otherwise it, it complains about that. Python gets rid of all that. So the only thing they do is they indent the text uh, by like about four characters uh, and that helps it understand that this is within a particular program. So the flow of the code can be defined by the indentation bit weird to get used to initially but it makes your code a lot easier to read so there's a kind of a pythonic way to uh, to do this um so george is saying uh, he played with q basic and then later v visual basic i remember q basic back in the day g was basic and then it became q basic on the uh, pc um by microsoft and uh, dominic's saying uh, he managed to get code oops copy code from an amstrad um 64 and still couldn't get the ball to bounce my brother's better at this stuff and that's it, you know, I've still got a lot of those code listings and those original books. I can probably bring some onto the stream, actually, of uh, original code listings. And back then in the 80s, programming was still in its infancy for microcomputers. So the code they, they put in these books was awful. You know, it really wasn't very easy to, to read and they didn't have a natural flow. So you'd have these go subroutines, which is like a, uh, it's like a function, but it would be in the listing. So you'd have like, you know, 10, 20, 40, all the lines would be numbered and then it would say go sub 100 and you'd have to go further down the code and then it would go back and return up to it. And it was spaghetti code. It was awful. Very difficult to follow. Uh, I tried porting some of them programs over to like Python and, you know, I was getting lost on that. So I think nowadays we have much better resources for learning online um, and Raspberry Pi have got some great stuff on there as well as Adafruit. They've got some really good um, material as well. Hi, Isabel. Um, lovely to see you and hear you. Thank you for that. And Tom said uh, he came, um, I used it and came um, arcing with C++. Yeah, came with the Arduino with C++. Yeah, so it's it's a weird version of C++ as well on the Arduino. It's not true C++. It's a variant. I believe when, when they, there was a project called processing.org. In fact, if you go to processing.org, uh, the website, you'll find all about this. Um, they they wrote this, um, in, they, they made chips and they wrote a language based on C++ uh, and it was for artists. And the idea is that you, you sketch something out there and that's why in the Arduino, they've still got that language in there about sketch. And it's because it's from processing.org where it's designed for artists and people with that sort of creative flair who weren't really programmers and coders and they just wanted to make things and uh, yeah a lot of that language and the thing that i have a problem with with arduino Ad ide and it's like their library management they have no software source control built into that and if you if you're familiar with programming uh, you'll use something like um, visual studio so if i launch this i've got visual studio on my computer here i can probably just quickly show you that if i go over to there and um, so this is, uh, I'm just currently writing a little uh, platform so I can um, build courses online. And on the left hand side here, I've got things like, you know, the things I've currently got open. Um, I've got all the, you know, the folder structure, but I've also got this button over here, which is the source code control. So I can very easily um, save a snapshot of my code in time. And if I make a mistake later on, I can go back to that version that worked um, 
just by using this source code control. And I can click down here as well to synchronize that with um, GitHub. So if my machine dies, I've got all my intellectual property up in the cloud, nice and safe. And the Arduino IDE doesn't have any of that. So I find it's a lot harder to, um, to do things that should be really frictionless, really easy to do. So synchronizing your code should just be in the background, really. So VS Code makes that really easy. Arduino IDE, you have to come out of that and you know do it in a, in a different tool set. So I, I have a bit of a problem with that. I think they're gonna be working on that and improving that over time. Maybe now with Pico and with Python being a second language for them to bring in, they might think about how to do that differently. And I don't think the answer should just be use a browser instead. Uh, I understand there is like an Arduino web version that just introduces more problems because I think only Chrome can access the serial port of your machine because of um, a web, is it web serial, web UART? There's kind of a whole library around that and it's to do with security and sandboxing things. So web browser is not necessarily the answer to everything. Sometimes just having a good old fashioned ID on your machine that's tuned to what you're doing is the best way. So I'm, I'm VS Code all the way on that. And Thonny, Thonny's a nice, uh, uh, nice clean user interface. We've got Thonny just there. So again, we can't do source code control in here, I don't think. Um, let's have a look. Just looking at the menu there to see if there's anything. No, it doesn't have anything specific to that, but it does have things like variables, which is quite nice. So you can see which variables you've used in your program. And uh, you can see on there, I've, I've saved that um, particular, excuse me, that piece of code that we wrote that's called code.py and that's actually on the Raspberry Pi Pico. So if I go to the, um, the file system, it'll just be sat there as a little Python file. Um, so yeah, the, the other thing that's nice about um, VS Code is you can do markdown and it will convert that in real time to um, marked up code. So if you know what that means, you know why that's a good thing. But Thonny's great. Um, I'm, I'm really behind that as a, as a product. So I can't wait to get this um, get this uh, plugged in, start having to play with things and um, you know learning how to bring this OpenCAT to life. So I'm gonna do a new series, I think, about that and about using MicroPython and also putting MicroPython on all these other chips as well. So we've got like the MicroBit, that can run MicroPython, um, the ESP32, the ESP8266, the Circuit Playgrounds. There's quite a few chips can run it. Um, unfortunately, the, the original Arduino can't because that's just an 8-bit chip, uh, but everything else pretty much can. So we'll see what the differences are there. And, um, certainly going to play with the, the Pico a bit more. So hopefully that's been uh, answered the question about what is all this about? Why is this a big deal? Um, where you can get them from, what it means, why it's different than the ESP32, for example. It hasn't got Wi-Fi, hasn't got Bluetooth, but it is only, you know, under four dollars which is just crazy it's got two mega ram it's got all these programmable state machines which is just crazy and you know we can use these in the real world to make our robots come to life so i'm really stoked by by all this so i can see now it's eight o'clock so that means we're we're pretty much uh, done with the show today so thanks for um, watching long um we're gonna be looking at python and MicroPython in the next couple of weeks i think um, when i've asked people what they want to to know more about it tends to be programming that's the topic that always comes up so let's do a bit more of that and uh, yeah have a great week and i shall probably drop a video midway through the week as well so watch out for that so thanks everybody for uh, for watching long i shall see you all very soon bye bye